Hey guys, welcome back to Raven Tech. In this video, I'm going to be covering at least the first step of getting your home lab set up to be able to host a website. Now, if you're wanting to do this for your professional website, I will give you a fair warning that the amount of bandwidth that you're going to get with a regular home internet, home ISP, it's not going to be enough. And you're going to take away from everything else that you plan on doing. You want to watch videos or stream or whatever, you're going to lose your bandwidth. Uh, there's also security issues. But if you still want to run a website, a small one, there are plenty of ways that you can actually still restrict the number of communications to your website and whatever. But there's general misunderstanding of what's involved in setting up one. So I just want to cover some of those as a basic. So first off, internet. Always displayed as a cloud on all the diagrams that you're going to generally see. And that is how the term cloud has taken over population as a buzzword of choice. How everything is in the cloud. That's because it's located online. Now, well, just a short little thing on that. Even going from your home PC, here's a PC, mine is not a full proper square or whatever, it'll go up into the internet and then down to whatever point in place. Now, that's great, but to you, it looks like it's up in the internet, but it's actually going up to the internet, doing all its communication that it needs up here, and then going down to whatever sources, be it uh, like Amazon, AWS, or... Uh, Google Cloud, or whatever, you know? So, how does that break down to you? Well, let me, let me cover that real quick. Fix my little cloud. All right. Now, your ISP, we'll just say, here is your internet service provider. They're located here. They have their own tunnel that goes out to the internet as a whole. And I'll give you a future video on more involved of what's in the internet, but in general for how I like to do my videos, I try to put things into as simple of English as possible. And that's a very complicated thing that not even I fully understand. And I've been doing this since, I've been working with computers since I'm not, I was nine years old. I'm 33 now and I understand a decent amount of it, but I'm not an expert by any means. But I've been doing it for a while. Well, anyway, so your ISP has their own communication out to the internet. All right, and then you're going to be handed a modem. Now, if you're using a VPN or whatever, that changes this map completely, but I'm going to keep this as basic of a setup as possible. So, they give you a modem. It could be a standard just DSL or cable modem, or it can be a combo box, which the majority of cases is a combo box. So we're going to say that this modem here also doubles as a router. Okay? So that's your modem, your router. You typically see that as going like 192.168.1.1 or 254 or 1010.1.1, I believe is the other one, or various other default gateways. So this right here will be known as your default gateway. And that's this device's IP address. That default gateway is handed out to your devices so that dev these devices generally know how to communicate back and forth with the modem. Okay? With me so far? All right. Let me clean this board real quick. So, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going with one of the most common IPs for default gateways, which is 192.168.1.254. Now, 
Why does the default gateway matter in this? Well, in general, <laughs> just uh, another part of understanding the communication path. It's easier to see for some people. So I'm displaying it in both parts, either by the IP address or the device. I've also simplified the matter so you know that this router, which is also the modem, communicates out through your ISP and goes out to the internet. All right, so you're gonna add in your own uh, servers. Now you're gonna do a Raspberry Pi, right? So let's just say, just for the sake of it, because you know the internet of things and everything, we're going to add in a Raspberry Pi, which honestly, <laughs> this looks more like a strawberry pie than a raspberry, but anyway, so there's your raspberry pie. Okay, that's going to be your server, and uh, there's various ways you can set this up. Pretty much anything, Linux or Windows or Mac, that you want to set up. But most commonly, because you can get them really dirt cheap, especially if you do a raspberry pi zero. I just did the raspberry pie. So. We're going to give this Raspberry Pi, we're going to set it up with 192.168.1.90.24. Slash 24, subnetting. This says that it can get to the entire range of there. So I am literally right now, I have this device set up on this default path, this uh, subnet that is provided by your router. Now, downside of this is any device on this subnet is going to be able to be seen by this Pi. Now, that is very dangerous because if this Pi gets hacked, then your entire network can be compromised. There is ways of securing that. I can cover that in later parts of the series when we get to more of the direct firewall portion. But again, just covering some basics. Now, you have a server, you've set it up with Raspberryan or um, Ubuntu Core or Arc Linux or anything like that. You have your default OS, you have your IP address, it's already set up to be able to communicate out to the internet. You can go this way out, you can pull websites down, great. Now you're thinking, okay, I want a web server. Okay, you want a web server, well you can install Apache, or uh, I'm going to put it up here on the screen here. <laughs> Nigix, I think it sounds pronounced. I'm not exactly sure. Um, Nigix, Nigix, I don't know. Uh, or various other providers like that. Usually those are the top two. Uh, Node.js, I believe, is another one. So you can install that, and that's great. You get a page that can be displayed. Uh, here's your index. HTML, you know, that's now located via here, and that's, you can get to it from localhost, which is 127.0.0.1, or by 192.168.1.90. Um, but then you're going, well, I have a, a PC here. I got a PC here. You find out, eh, eh, you can you can communicate to the website here, but not to here. Okay, well that takes you to step rule number one. You didn't configure your firewall, so now you're gonna have to configure your firewall on this thing to be able to host up port 80 or 443, depending on if you're doing HTTPS or HTTP or HTTPS. That then fixes this path here. Okay, now you can talk out to that. Well, I go from a computer out here, and I want to go to the internet and go to example.com. Right? Well, example.com, that's what I named this device here. That's example.com. So how do I go here? Suddenly it's not working. I can't get to it. And you're going, oh, well, just open up a port to the internet. Here's a problem. This is a not a public IP address, private, the private IP address. So you go, okay, well, how, do, how does this get to the internet? I'm gonna go ahead and I have the name configured up here, blah, 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 which by the way, that's a 
whole different segment again. There's just different parts to this thing that most people don't understand. I'm going to slow down for a second just for that I'm talking fast. Anyway, so I need to get from here to here, and how do I do that? Well, you're then going to have to do a whole other step. This goes back to the firewall section. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to make up an IP address. And here's your public IP address of 34128921. Um, yeah, we'll say that. All right, and it, that probably exists somewhere. I have no idea whose IP address is in that. Fair warning. But it, uh, that's a number I just pulled out of my head. It's a public IP address. You want to equal out to example.com. Okay, so 34128921. You want it to equal example.com. Right now, you go to it and you get a big because that does not work. Well, how do you fix that? That goes back to firewalling. So, this IP address, you want it to equal to this. That's not just firewall. That's the thing, though. It's DNS-related. So you got to deal with DNS. you got to deal with firewalls. you got to deal with port forwarding. Or, depending on... You don't want to go with port forwarding and you want to go, you have to then NAT it, which is network address translation. <laughs> you can see why this starts to get complicated because then you've got to think about all these different things. Now, for your DNS, not only do you have to do the name server recognition externally, like outside of your environment, you're going to have to go ahead and set up with an actual... Na uh, domain name provider, Google domains, GoDaddy, etc. so forth, because the big grand design of the public core firewall, not firewalls, DNS providers and stuff, to get the names out there globally, you got to sign up with one of them. Um, you can do for home labs and stuff, if you have, because that's another thing, to get this to be static, you're going to generally have to buy a business class internet provider or internet service. Home providers, then you start dealing with a dynamic DNS, and then that's a whole different ballgame in itself. And don't get me started on what's involved with making it, making your web providing services here able to do email, because that just gets even more complicated. But anyway, so you have already gone in bought a uh, domain name, the example.com, you have gone, let's just say you're going to um, like Google domains, not sponsored, but say you go ahead and you do a uh, domain name at uh, Google domains, right? So say you went to Google domains, you bought the domain name, example.com. So you go up here and you say in your name record, that this IP address equals example.com. Okay, now people go to example.com and it takes you to this IP address. You still don't get your website. And you're going, okay, I just gave myself my IP address. Where's my name? Okay, well, great. It knows that IP address is available. Now you need to open that port. Now internally, before you even do that, on your device, you also need to make sure, and if it's in Linux, for example, you need to go to Etsy host and Etsy host name, name not main. You need to make sure those are set. Then, if you're using bind or something equivalent, you also have to go in and configure bind for DNS. So those are three main things that you got to configure. Once you've done this internally, you got to go to your firewall, and this not just your device's firewall to open port. You got to open port 
480 plus 443, depending on if you're going to use this, we'll just say that, you know, whatever. Great handwriting, I know. Um, you got to do this on your device's firewall, but you're going to also have to do the port forwarding. So port forwarding says your router, you're going to say port 80 goes to the 192.168.190, right? Or 443. Goes to port that. So then you have that where it knows that those ports go there. Or, do the natting, you got to do a NAT translation. And then you basically would take that address and translate it into one of the IP addresses that you have available in your range if you bought more than one IP address. Now, if you didn't buy one more than one IP addresses, which even with business class, you don't typically get more than one unless you pay extra, you're going to use port forwarding. So let me see. That takes you to that point. So you configured it to where you've directed your router to port, uh, for port 80 or 443 or both to go from 192.168.1.90, and it translates up to 34.128.92.128. So then that basically will take it, so everything from the internet, and here's your internet again. Anybody going from the internet can then go through your router, right? I'll just say R. Goes through your router, and then your really crappily drawn Raspberry Pi. Okay? Now, is this an overly simplified diagram? Am I going too fast? Yes. Uh, I'm going to be breaking it down into this series because I'm going to cover a couple of things, including installation of the web server, the LAMP services. This is going to be just a one or two different things of it with what I dub to be probably the easiest methods to get you started. Do I recommend, especially if you're going to do this for non-home testing and if you're going to open it up to the web and you need it to be something more readily available and you don't want to deal with some security concerns about people doing a dynamic, um, what's it called, a denial of service of attack or hacking you or man, man in the middle in you or anything like that. Do I re uh, recommend other things? Yes, I do. Uh, in one situation, I actually host with Green Geeks and down in the description, you'll see my affiliate link to Green Geeks. Um, I recommend it. I like them. They work. I uh, had very few problems with them. And usually it's a matter of just opening a ticket and saying, yo, bud, something's down. They'll turn around and fix it. Within couple of hours at worst case, usually a few minutes. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend it. <clears throat> but we're going to go ahead and discuss setting up a server, a nice little simple server. I'm going to be using this most likely with my Raspberry Pi Zero uh, W, which is, if you're familiar with them, it's a little teeny tiny computer that I do not have readily available to show you guys, but I'll put a picture on the screen. It's very simple. If you guys have ever worked with it, you know that it's very small spec system that just is perfect for what you need for a basic website. Everybody questions and says, well, how big do I need it? Do I need it to be really powerful? Depends on how busy your site is. In all honesty, especially on the smaller packages, but most web providers do not provide you with a huge system. Because for average websites, even ones with a decent amount of traffic, they don't have a great huge CPU or RAM or storage and stuff. Storage, yes, that can get bad depending on the size of your database and your images and what you're storing. So storage is usually one where they'll say unlimited storage, which is never truly unlimited, but for the most people it's unlimited. RAM, don't really need that much RAM. 512 megabytes 
you can run actually a decent a decent amount of traffic on that surprisingly uh, but usually about a gig would give you perfect amount um bandwidth yes you need a large tunnel especially if you get a lot of traffic because besides your regular user base you're going to get a whole bunch of garbage bots and search engines and just random crap that's out there on the internet now that's going to go ahead and hit your site so all of these things will be covered we're going to be working on the videos um, if you guys have any questions, concerns, if you think I missed anything, uh, if there's something that you'd like to see in the next couple of videos that I'm going to do, go ahead and you can hit me down in the description. You can also reach me at wbakke at ravenhawktech.com. If you have any questions, you can send it to me directly. If you don't want it discussed in the comment directly, you can just email me. Uh, you can also reach me at the Twitter Instagram, TikTok, various other social media medias, Instagram, so forth. I'm on most of them. Um, if you want me, if you want to watch me do some stupid, random, bad <laughs> jokes and videos and stuff, I am hamming it out on TikTok. That's so I am going to still putting out content. I'm going to try to make sure that it is quality. But until, until then, uh, also. I'm going to link put a card up here. I do have my first Patreon. Thank you very much, Lucky Green. Um, if you would like to help out the channel, uh, make me be able to focus a little bit more on this, as well as increase the type of stuff I can provide, because then I can look into more things like VMUG or MSDN or things like that, which will help educate me, which in turn will help me educate you. Um, you can join up. Uh, right now I have it as a dollar a month, which is really tiny. Uh, I wanted to be fair. So I just put it as a small amount. Uh, feel free if you wanted to add more. <laughs> but the link is down in the description. I, honestly, just simply liking and subscribing and sharing my videos is a huge help to me. That being said, see you next time.